there seems like we know no trance. Let me see, because the, the lighting changes to kind of seem so large. What? I just want to see how the lighting is oh. for all of you. So I have a, a now, what do you want me to do, huh? Uh, yeah, I, first thing I thought for the society would be really good to have some induction, some uh, uh, material, how you do the hypnosis, uh, how you go about uh, uh, putting somebody into a trance. It would be one of the first things that, that uh, I know the people would like to see. What time is it now? Uh, 115. I think there's another subject coming who will be willing to be videotaped and come in Tucson. Okay, we can start. Should we begin now? Yes. Yes, we can begin. The first thing about a hypnotic technique is the attitude of the operator. He should manifest an air of confidence. He should have no doubt at all. His entire bearing should be one of complete confidence and full expectation. There's no reason to be doubtful about yourself because you're not doing transinduction yourself. Your patient is responding by going into a trance. And it's all up to the patient, not to the operator. The operator can only furnish a favorable climate for the trance to begin. Oh, you uncross your legs, put a little feet on the floor, your arms up against your chest, and protein your that. And now look at the far corner of that valence up there. Just look in that direction. You don't need to talk. You don't need to move. And while you're not moving, not talking. I'm going to remind you of something that happened a long time ago. I first went to school and were confronted by the task of learning to write the letters of the alphabet. It looked to me like a horrendous task, a very great big job. Very difficult, all those different shapes and forms. And I was complicated by the fact that printed letters, written letters, capital letters, small letters. I slowly, gradually, you formed a visual mental image. A visual mental image located somewhere in your brain, located there permanently, only you didn't know that is being located in your brain permanently. And while I've been talking to you, your respiratory rate has changed, your heart rate has changed, your motor, your motor tones has changed, your blood pressure has changed, your motor reflexes have changed. And when next I say the word now, your eyes will close now. It will stay closed. And I'm going to give you a task to do. There are many things you can do at an unconscious level, at a trance level. After a while, I don't know how soon, 
You'll have to wait and find out. One of your hands is going to lift up. Maybe both. Maybe the right, maybe the left. Just which hand you don't know yet. And soon you'll know. And slowly begin to lift up toward your face and move more and more rapidly. And so you feel that your hand itself wants to lift. You've got nothing to do with it. Your hand wants to lift. And it lift up higher and higher. I'll be a little jerk. And then another. And lifting. And you won't really know whether it's right, left, or both. I a little jerk there, so I'll be another little jerk. You have to wait. The elbow will bend, your wrist will lift, your hand will lift. Up it comes, higher and higher. That's right, another jerk. Soon it'll be all the way off your leg. Coming up. Now some of you respond quickly, others respond slowly. It's a learning process to go into a trance. And you give the patient or the subject all the time they need. And they are getting acquainted with the aspects of their living about which they know very little. Now what he's demonstrating is he has not fully let loose some conscious awareness. He's too desirous of being effective instead of relinquishing all interest and in letting his hands move. Have I spoken rightly? Sooner or later, your head will nod yes. And you know that the the separation, the head movement. The ordinary head movement, yes. Uh, the hypnotic, yes. Now, pretty soon you will know that your head is going to lift. He's rather tense. His falling reflex indicates his tension. He wants so much to learn. And look right on the videotape. Instead of forgetting about it. That's all right. We all have to learn our own way. Marjorie, do you realize you're in a trance already? Mm -hmm. Naomi, you're in a trance. You know it, don't you? Well, you know it as soon as your eyes close and stay closed. And your head will begin to lift. If you have that slight movement, I 
I'm going to lick your hand. You touch the patient's hand in various, wrist in various places. You let loose and maintain pressure in one area and you shift to the hand and you touch very gently, very softly and you make little pressure. This way you lessen pressure and the hand will move accordingly and you touch in several places and keep changing it until finally the patient doesn't know when you have ceased touching his hand and you get catalepsy. Now some patients have difficult learning to develop catalepsy to levitate as soon as your elbow is going to bend your hand will start moving toward your face up it comes another little jerk another oh, the conscious way of lifting your hand is a smooth movement and you'll notice that this is a jerky movement because that's the way a person levitates the hand in the irregular jerky fashion. You can touch your face, I don't know just where, and then it'll appear to you that your hand is glued to your face. Always there. Getting closer. Getting closer. And your hand will stick to your face. And slowly, gradually, you'll become aware that you can't take your hand away from your face. It seems to have a will all its own and wants to cling to your face. You can try to move your face away from your hand, but it won't. Your hand will follow or you won't be able to move your head away. Um, the other hand is going to live. Coming up. Coming up. Coming up. Got to be higher. Your hand is lifting hard more and more rapidly. So it'll reach your face. And you will know that you can't move your hand down. It just stays there. And the only way you can move it down is to reach up with your right hand, take hold of it, and force it down. Your right hand is going to want to do that. It's going to insist on doing that. Up goes your hand, Marge. Up higher, higher. Up. And then 
a question that you don't know about in your mind, Marty. Your unconscious doesn't know whether to move your right hand or your left hand. There's a debate going on. And it's going to be a question of competition between your hands. And your hand, right hand, is going to reach up. Take hold of your wrist and force your left hand down. You have to force it. You're seeing one type of learning here. Or the initial wound difficult to begin. That's in your hand. over and grasp your wrist, your left wrist, and force it down. And it won't be easy. And you're observing a lack of body orientation. <coughs> he really doesn't know where his right, his left wrist <coughs> is. And he doesn't really know how to get his hands over his wrist. It takes time and effort. <coughs> In other words, he has body orientation. <coughs> What's the Pull harder. Pull harder. And how very slowly have you opened your eyes just a wee bit, very little, and look at your hands and see only your hand and close your eyes immediately and open them again a wee bit and again see just your hand. You've got to have practice learning how to see just your hand. You'll keep opening and closing your eyes and looking until finally you see just your head. In the case of Marjorie, she demonstrated very thoroughly a lack of body orientation. What the average psychotherapist doesn't know is that people have very faulty images of themselves. They don't really know what they look like. They don't really know the feeling of the various parts of their body. They grow up thinking, my hands are my hand. Uh, a recent study made uh, a series of subjects are shown photographs of hands. And they didn't know that among the photographs are photographs of their own hands. 
and they fail to recognize their own hands. They sometimes fail to recognize a photograph of their face. A study was made at Harvard some 30, 40 years ago in which Harvard students are photographed and tape recorded and they are asked to look at a, a whole series of photographs and the operator uh, divided the negative in two halves and used a negative side of the negative on one side and a positive side of the negative on the other half and printed the entire face. They couldn't recognize their face when there are two right halves, two left halves, one negative side of the face and the other a positive side. People really don't know what they look like because they've seen mirror images of themselves. And for you to really grasp that, hold some printed material up to a mirror and try to read it you find out how very difficult it is to recognize a word. Oh, Marjorie, your hands are going to move up toward your mouth. Up toward your mouth. All the way up. And move rapidly. your right hand is going to lift up. Are you practicing opening and looking at your hands and seeing nothing but your hands? And nod your head when you can see only your hands but nothing else. Now when you want to explore the phenomenon of deep noses, you often have to give yourself a uh, practice time in learning. Up to your mouth, bending the elbow, lifting the wrist, bending the elbow still more, important thing to bear in mind when you're dealing with subjects who have poor body orientation. You didn't learn where your ears were because your parents taught you to touch your forehead, your nose, your eyes, your mouth, your chin, your ears. You had to do the separate learning. The learning touch your ear and then the reach across your face, touch the opposite ear, the contralateral ear. And then running it with the other hand was much more rapidly a T. And you didn't really know where your ears were because you learned it from down up and up down. That only located your ears in that relationship. There had to be a time when Accidentally, you touch your ear, the contralateral ear, from above, over the top of your head. And if you watch the baby's face, when it first does that, you see the startled look on the face. The baby still doesn't know where the ear is really located until someday, accidentally, 
it reaches behind its head and feels its ear. Then the baby really knows where the ear is. If you watch uh, infants, they learn to recognize a noise in front of them. At first, they hear a noise, and they look, they don't know where it is. They go around. And they begin to recognize a noise in front of them. And they discover the noise isn't in front of them. Yeah, maybe it's over to the right or to the left. It's a much harder job to learn to recognize a sound that the sound comes from behind you. And the last bit of learning is to recognize a sound that comes from below you and from above you. It's a long, slow process of learning. And both this gentleman and Margie are demonstrating a very extensive lack of body orientation. He, he was here once before, last spring, at which time I noticed his lack of body orientation. Now, the next step in training with Saudi is to thank him and tell him, take your time and wake up. You'll find it difficult. You make the effort of waking. How are you feeling fine? That's right. How are you still more, more, more awake? Finally, your eyes will open widely. I know you don't want to wake up. Now look at that piece of driftwood over there. All right. Our purpose of asking then to look at that piece of driftwood is to distract them. Because when you distract them, you bring about an amnesia. It's the best way of producing an amnesia. You're conversing with somebody, telephone rings, you answer that brief call, hang up the receiver, and then you turn to your person you were talking to, say, what was that I was talking about? You develop an instant amnesia. And so you employ that principle. Now, do you think you're awake? Yeah. You sure? I still feel very relaxed. Are you <clears throat> sure you're awake? I don't think so. You're really not awake. What? You're really not awake. I'll be in the uncertain blink, the laid, red blink. 
That's right. And you keep wanting to close your eyes. Yeah, I enjoyed the train. And you can see the struggles to remain awake. His eyes are going to close. You know I had no doubt in my voice at all. He had his doubts. He had to struggle with his doubts. And he's still tense. This time, I want to do as before. Your hand is going to lift up toward your face, all the way up, all the way up, all the way up, all the way. You literally see the improved learning. A much quicker locating of his face. And now your left hand is going to lift up and force your right hand down. And a parallel of this learning is watching children learning to write for the first time. They try to write a letter, and you'll see their feet scoring, their shoulders moving, their head, head and shoulders moving, body twisting, feet moving uncertainly, and facial grimaces as they try to write the letter. Here you see the groping movements, the uncertainty. Are we alone, Marty? Kind of. Kind of. Kind of alone. Close your eyes, and next time you open them, you'll be more alone. And Naomi, I want you to take your time and slowly awaken from the neck up while your body remains asleep. Just from the neck up while your body remains asleep. Isn't it an interesting feeling that you don't want to?
and keep your eyes open. Let your head be wide awake and your body sound asleep. And discover that you really don't know how to move your arm or your leg. You don't know how to stand up. You see the groping movements of her hand. He's trying to get in touch with her hands. And Margie, soon you'll open your eyes and we will be much more alone. How does it feel? Have your body asleep, Naomi? Feels like it's not there. What's that? It feels almost like it's not there. It feels as if it were not there. And doing experimental work with somebody is often much slower than working with patients who have an unconscious purpose to be served. These subjects have a conscious purpose to be served. They want to learn, which interferes and makes them slower when they have an unconscious purpose that they want serves they learn more rapidly but you can learn more about the phenomena by using experimental subject when do you think you'll discover you have a right hand Naomi what's that And that, of course, is an infantile utterance. Only Naomi doesn't realize it. A baby has to look to see if he has a hand. He has to look to see if he has a foot. But, and a dog, they just know it. They don't have to look and see. You realize, of course, that Naomi is not fully awake. There's a hypnotic passions, a rigidity of facial expression. And then you'll see normal eyeball movements and uh, often you see the hypnotic rigidities of eyeball movements. And we've all learned since childhood to turn and look when you're spoken to. I talk to Naomi, she hears me, doesn't even turn her eyeball toward me. Are you discovering what hard work it is to keep your eyes open, Naomi? It's a nice thing to discover. You watch the nursing baby. 
Yearly done nursing. I begin over shut more and more slowly and finally they close. I was speaking about a baby and I said close. He's being more and more going deeper and deeper in the trance. And we are alone, aren't we, Marty? Are we not? You now know when your eyes are open over times when you didn't see anything. Your eyes are open, but you weren't seeing anything. And when her eyes were open and her eyeballs did not move. Uh, Frank Petty, Professor Emeritus, University of Kentucky, had a good somnambulous subject. Who so, had her eyes open, wide open, and Frank affixed markers to her eyelids, and he had a movie camera and ran continuously and in four hours that girl did not blink once and her cornea did not get dry. Strasburg of New York had a subject with a head in a vice so it couldn't move the head and he posed a high power microscope on the cornea and conjunctiva union, where they meet. And through the high power microscope, you can see the capillaries. And at the junction of the cornea with the conjunctiva, the capillaries are in the shape of palisade arcades. And as a person goes into a trance, you can get it in the palisade and I gave it flattening out to a flat line, which indicates that there's a change of shape of the eyeball. The eyeball flattens. And because it flattens, you don't need to blink to get uh, the like or fluid to moisten the eye. It just flows over that surface. Mrs. Erickson and I were walking down the street in New York City and came to the Corning Glass Building. And to our astonishment, the window panes were not visible. I stopped to look and all the windows were no window panes then we realized it's the invisible glass. And we tried on level beds to see the, the glass. We couldn't. And Mr. Eric said, I think I'll go into an auto-hypnotic trance and see how the building looks. And in the auto-hypnotic trance, with the frightening of her eyeballs, she was able to see a window pane as clearly as you do when you know, we can see you look at a window. And I view those window panes 
taking on the corners, the bottom, the top. <coughs> but I couldn't even see the window paint. As she saw it very plain. Came out of dance and they're gone now. <coughs> and he went back in the dance and when the paint became visible to her. And how your head will slowly lift up toward your face. And do so suddenly and rapidly. <coughs> Quickly. Up your face now. Up, up, and you will notice just by directing my voice toward you, made him respond. And now you can awaken. Awaken. Open your eyes. Put your hand up to your face quickly. Hold your head out like this. Look at your thumb there. And notice that it keeps coming closer and closer to your face. By the time your thumb touches your face, you'll be in a deep trance. Now sometimes in a group, you'll have somebody who'll become somnambulistic, all of them. And some will see a mirror of the group shows an insufficient body orientation. Other groups you'll see very excessive body orientation. The presence of the group has a great deal to do with it. Now, he went into a trance the first day, and he demonstrated thoroughly a lack of body orientation. As I knew he would, because in ordinary waking behavior, he shows an absence of body orientation. A certain aloofness about him, a certain holding back as natural to him. And the entire group sensed that. I wouldn't be at all surprised if they took their first lesson from him. And would you like to awaken from the neck up?
Go ahead, I wake you from the neck up. Now, why did you awaken? I couldn't tell who you were talking to. Huh? I couldn't tell who you were talking to. Now, I was directing my voice toward those two, and he couldn't tell to whom I was talking. In other words, location of sound is learned so unrealizingly that when a given situation arises, they can manifest it. There was something wrong with my voice when I was speaking to them. He couldn't quite make it out, so he opened his eyes to see what was going on. And you still think you're awake now, don't you? Not as much. Not as much. Would you like to get acquainted with your body, Naomi? It feels like it's more here. Yeah. It feels like it's more here. It feels like it's more here. It feels heavy. Now, what part is more here? Your left forearm. What, what is the next part? The rest of that arm. What's that? The rest of that arm and the shoulder. Where's the arm and the Has movement returned? I'm not trying to move it. What's that? I'm not trying to move it. You're not sure you can move it. Which arm do you think you'll be able to move first? The left. Which one? The left. The left. You sure of that? Yeah. I, think, I think I moved my other arm before. Yeah, I moved my other arm. Is that? I moved my other arm before. When do you think you get elbow movement? I think all of you thought you could get elbow movement this way. Yeah, this way. That's elbow movement. This is our movement. The way the hypnotic subject can be literal is amazing. Now, which leg do you want to come back first? Your okay. yeah, left. Any reason for the left side? I have some trouble with it sometimes. What's that? I have, I've had some trouble with it sometimes. Yeah, what? I've had some trouble with it. Like that. That's in trouble with it. Oh, 
have movement come back in your left arm, your left leg. So that be very comfortable. Feels different, doesn't it? And you're watching Naomi do something classical. And Margaret Mead and Gregory Bates and Jane Vila under Bali in 1937. They spent three years there. Margaret Mead uh, took notes on everything. Gregory Bateson did a photographic work, and Jane Bilo worked on dreams among the ballerines. Before Dr. Mead went to Bali, she corresponded with me extensively for three years, asking searching questions about hypnosis and auto hypnosis in the Occidental. Oh, I informed her fully about Occidental hypnosis. And she got a body and for the purpose of studying a culture in which auto hypnosis plays a large part. And when she returned after three years studied there, he brought with her some uh, movie films. And she asked me to have somebody who was intelligent but had no knowledge of hypnosis view those films and make a commentary on them. And she was separately someone who was a good hypnotic subject to view the films and make a commentary on them. And she wanted me to make a separate commentary on the film. Now the intelligent person who viewed the film and had no doubt of him noticing the two girls are dancing. Marguerite asked anything in particular about the bigger girl or the smaller girl? You know, just having good time dancing. And then part of the film where a man was crossing a vacant lot. The commentator said, that man is crossing the vacant lot. He's walking along slowly. At an even pace. I reach the other side, walking down the street. All the comments were of that character. Now uh, the hypnotic subject who viewed the film was Mrs. Ireson. And she said, two little girls are dancing. A bigger one is in a trance. Now she's waking up. Now they're both awake. Now the smaller girl is going into the trance and they're still dancing. And now the girl has joined the little girl in the trance state. And they see me enjoying the dance in both the waking and the trance state. It came the pilot film where the man was crossing the street. You know, the man is wide away. They're starting across that line. Well, he didn't go in a trance. By the time he reaches the middle of that vacant lot, he'll be in a deep trance. Now he's there, he's in a deep trance. And he's continuing to cross the lot, and he's beginning to awaken. 
By the time he reaches the other side of the lot, he will be wide awake. And my means notes agreed. Now, people are socialized. A, a visitor will drop into a trance and socialize, make them out of trance, and the host may drop into all hypnotic trance, or they both may go into all hypnotic trance and have their conversation in the trance state. A man being tried for murder knows the situation is out of his head. He goes in all hypnotic trance and sleeps restfully, comfortably, while the lawyers and the judge and the jury take care of the matter in hand. He doesn't need to know what's going on. He'll find out at the end of the trial. There's no hurry about that. So you did lift your hand up to your face. <laughs> You know when you did it? You know why you did it? You don't know why? How you do? Well, you see, you didn't know earlier. How long do you think you'll keep the hand there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you realize you can't put it down? Certainly by dinner time tonight you don't want your hand down, won't you? You gonna wait until dinner time? <laughs> Are you able to stand up yet, Naomi? I'm starting to move my other side. What's that? I'm starting to move my other side. Confusing, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> you know, I use that for for women having babies. Produce a uh, sacral block. You can't stand up. They can't move their legs, and they don't feel any pain. And it's fairly easily done. And a baby's about to arrive. And useful information. Long before my daughter Betty Alice, well, I hypnotized her when she was 10 years old. And she was able to accomplish a lot of things. Of course, for several years, she was in college, in fact. She could do any hypnotic thing except develop anesthesia. And I was using her as a demonstration subject in Detroit. And I asked her to develop anesthesia. And she said, you know I can't tell you. That's impossible for me. I said, well, I agree. And so let's uh, do something else. A phenomenon of dissociation. 
will be fascinating. So see yourself sitting over there on the other side of the room, and she hallucinated herself being over there. And of course, I directed my boys. She's sitting, well, she's sitting right in front of me. I was standing up. While she was hallucinating herself being over there, I took a small strand of hair and lifted her off the seat. She didn't notice it. <laughs> she was over there. How could she possibly feel pain here when she was over there? And the others were very surprised. And then after I had her come back, sit in the chair, I had her remember what had happened. And she said, that was a dirty trick, Daddy. You would never take a hypnotic subject. I, I think I was justified. Someday you may, may marry, and someday you may have a baby, and you may want the hypnotic anesthesia I've just taught you. And you were too stubborn to learn in the proper way, like cause you dissociate and thus taught you anesthesia. She said, I forgive you. <laughs> Many years later, she entered the delivery room at Luke Air Base. No, yeah, Luke Air, not Luke, um, Nellis Air Base in Nevada. And she came in you had to the obstetrician. You don't have to worry about anesthesia, Dr. Jones. You don't have to be nervous because you were a student, my daddy. On the delivery table, the lower half of my body will belong to you. Only the upper half will belong to me. And she proceeded to entertain me. The every room personnel uh, accounts of her teaching experiences in Australia. All mistakes she made. I and Dr. Jones said, hey, don't you want to know what it is, Betty Alice? He turned and looked. Oh, it's a boy. Give him to me. I'm like all other mothers. I want to count the fingers and the toes. The upper half of her body was hers. Lower half belonged to the doctor. <laughs> so if there's any pain, he had it. He didn't have it. <laughs> I told my daughter's in law the same thing. I so that morning, I left for a Wisconsin lecture. Uh, and in Milwaukee, I got a telephone call from her stating, I had my baby this afternoon. I know you didn't think he would arrive for a couple of weeks, and I didn't either, but he came this afternoon. I called the doctors. I made arrangements with them for a home delivery. And when they arrived, I told them I had my abdominal contractions at fairly rapid intervals. And then her face, the expression changed. He went in all that night dress. He had a uh, uterine contraction. And so was she awakened in trance. Now she told the doctor, when you saw the episiotomy, I want to count the stitches. And so, the doctor told her, I'm going to 
so be the enemy now, and you count the stitches aloud. And I said, one, two, three, four, and so on. And we asked her to describe the stitches. He said, it was like putting a needle through a thick blanket. And that's all, just a, a needle going through a thick blanket. That's the way it felt to her. She had her wisdom teeth surgically removed. He furnished her own anesthesia and her own capillary control. Over the next day, the unfortunate dentist, who didn't know anything about hypnosis, was surprised when she came in for a checkup visit. He said, what's wrong? Your face isn't swollen. He said, it didn't need to be swollen. I had no pain, I have no pain now. And I let him, my gums bleed a reasonable amount, and I stopped the bleeding. And did you enjoy putting your hand down? When did you know your hand was down? A little while ago. A little while ago. Was it all the way down before you knew it? Did you put me in the trance the first couple of days? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in and out of trances every day. Did you know you're going to close your eyes going to trance right now? <laughs> When you get around her, you can open your eyes and wake up. How long do you think you can keep them open? <laughs> Not very long. <laughs> <laughs> Now you see what doubt does. That's why the upper should have the doubt. Because he knows what direction to doubt. And that is your expectation. His eyes were closed. And stay closed. This adds to expectation and confidence. Can you stand up now, Naomi? Can you sit down? <laughs> <laughs> I do like that momentary doubt. <laughs> you know what you're going to do later today? I know some of the things I'm going to do later. Are some things you're going to do that you don't know about? It's certainly possible. <laughs> Even lately. The thing that flashed across your mind yesterday? Yeah. 
Do you mind telling what that thought was? Hmm? Gonna bake a pie. <laughs> <laughs> what was the other thought? Hmm? The other thought of what I'm going to do today? That you thought yesterday. Yeah, it flashed across your mind very briefly. Mind Terry? Well, I felt scared at that point. Hmm? I felt scared. Yeah. Why? Um, I, was, I think I was scared of you leaving. A what? Of you, I was scared of you leaving. Um, and what was the other thought? Scared of me leaving. <laughs> and what was the other thought? About what? About, um, about your health, about your coming and going, about my coming and going. What, what else? tell you, you've been in a car or something happened a long time ago. I was in college and one of the college mates was majoring in art and psychology. And he encountered a fortune teller fortune teller and told him his father's first name, his mother's first name, named his siblings, told him the name of the high school he had attended, and Harold thought that was absolutely phenomenal. I said, all right, Harold, I'll go with you to that fortune teller. I will have an envelope in my inside jacket pocket. After we've gone to fortune tower, you keep your face blank. Don't be startled by anything. Uh, something unusual will happen. Go ask the fortune teller and Tell my fortune. He gave me father's first name, mother's first name. Gave me the number of my siblings. Named them. He told me the name of the high school I attended. The village near which I lived. I lived on a farm. I thank you, walked away, and I took that seal in out of my jacket pocket, handed it to Harold. He opened it, gave me a fortune teller, and given the wrong name for my father, the wrong name for my mother, the wrong name for siblings, wrong names for all my siblings, the wrong name of my high school, wrong name of me village I lived near. And he did have, I grew up on a farm. 
And I said, now how could he have given you all those wrong names? I said, when I asked him if I would follow the name, I moved my lips in a certain way. And I said, Thomas, to myself, he was a good lip reader. He read every wrong name that I thought of. <laughs> and how I had to approve of it from that envelope. Now you know what you did when you said pie? <laughs> what kind of pie is it? You like apple pie. What kind of apple pie? and playwright George Bernard Shaw who said and ladies in the longest figure things that run on the head like lice and when you watch a lady you watch her lips you notice her thoughts are running through her head What are you talking about, Marty? Mm -hmm. Wondering if you can read thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't, should I? It's okay if you keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> There's a sudden bright look in your eyes, Naomi. But you briefly come back to the beginning of the session when you talked about <clears throat> the air of confidence. What I would like to know is, would you at any given point relate your doubt about where the trance would be going or the, the therapeutic process as a whole? Would you relate to the patient, the client, or the subject that you are in doubt about where it's going? No. By let him doubt in the direction I want him to go. When I want him to go in trance, I can doubt that he can stay awake. <laughs> you want to tell that thought? I was just thinking that that's a nice way to have doubts, having them in the way that serves you. Yeah, it serves the purpose of the patient. I doubt if you can keep your hands in your lap.
Who? The person's name was Al Pining, and it was at the Illinois School of Professional Psychology in Chicago. It had to do with a course I was taking in hypnosis. Is that an accredited school? It's uh, working on its accreditation right now. It's a new school, and it's going through the process of it. Here's your sheet, please. Pardon? Here's your oh. sheet. I'm not going to last on this. I may as well switch right now. Do you like the reference here? Mm -hmm. No, actually not. Do you want to do it quickly? But, uh, how about a phone? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What I'm doing now. Yeah. I see your face against the light. Now, that hour. Because mm, it gets very dark for the camera now. Just a uh, full bun. Why would you alright this one? It didn't do it. It did appear. First thing I'd like to see is, is that I work on the assumption that you function at a conscious level and also at an unconscious level. By the conscious level of functioning, I mean that while you are here, for the purpose of listening to me and learning, you're going to divide your attention and pay attention to the rugs, the bookcases, the pictures on the wall, the presence of others. Uh, you'll note the color purple. Everything that's irrelevant to the instruction you're going to be given. In other words, consciously, you're oriented to your surroundings. Your unconscious mind, however, is inwardly oriented and it makes use of learnings that you've acquired over a lifetime of experience. 
and in your conscious function, you depend upon those learnings, or rather you depend on the end results of those learnings. You know how to walk. Do you think you would tell me how you walk in a straight line down the street? At a steady pace, do you think you could? Why not? You speak louder. Well, I'm concentrating on balancing. I'm also not thinking about you know, other things that I might be doing. Actually, I live to sometimes I don't think about how high. Oh, so will you describe how you walk down six blocks in a street with no traffic? Right Any kind. You say, Tanya, at a steady pace. Could you walk at a steady pace? I, th I think so, I'm not sure. In a straight line. If I really, I think I'd have to really concentrate if you do it. I'm not sure. And will you succeed? I don't know. Why don't you know? Because I haven't done it. And it depends on how much I would keep, it, how important it was to me, how much I would be willing to keep concentrating on it. Well, if you are hired to walk down the street, no traffic, walk at a steady pace in a straight line, could you do it then? What would you be likely to do? Thing. Staying in a straight line. Anything on the street, storefronts, you know, an airplane going on, other people. Even if there wasn't any traffic. How would you show that distraction? Um, I might slow my pace. I might quicken my pace. I might veer off the line. I think along with my age, my hearing is... Oh, talking softly. Yeah. So I might veer off the line. Why would you veer off the line? Because um, if I were concentrating on staying on it, my balance, I don't think my balance would keep me right on it, and I'd be moving towards whatever I was interested in. What would you move toward? Whatever I happen to notice. Well, speaking as a person, what would you veer toward? Could be other people. Um, I said no traffic. No, no people traffic either? No. Could be a shop window. Um, could be a picture. Could be even a street sign. Because um, I'd probably be prone to read the signs. And I'm not very easily to move towards that. How long would it take to be a street sign? Not very long, but long enough, I think, to keep me from concentrating on what I was doing. And you? If I were walking, if I were asked to walk a straight line, if it were an assignment, I would really have to make an effort to concentrate to walk down a straight line. I normally don't pay attention to whether I walk straight or, or how. Could you walk at a steady pace? I would have to concentrate on it. That Why? If, if there, the assignment were that I had to walk down a straight line at a steady pace, I would really have to concentrate on it. Could you do it? If someone gave me the assignment and the assignment made sense to me, I would try my best to do it. If it didn't make sense, I'm not sure. Why couldn't you walk 
as to the peace. Why couldn't I? What to, mechanically or as a person? As a person. <laughs> I just, I guess I wouldn't do anything, I don't do things just at a steady pace. The pace changes. Why? Depending on, on the situation, how I feel. God. Anybody walking down the street, is going to pause, or slow down, in approaching an intersection. That's right. At what distance from the curb that occur? At what distance would one pause for an intersection? That depends whether one pays much attention or is preoccupied with some thoughts and suddenly there's the curb and you have to stop. Or you would watch people, you see that they start to slow down at one distance from the curb when there is a stoplight. Right. A different uh, distance when there is a stop sign. And at the curb, what they would they do? They would, if it's a sign, they would stop. If it's a light, depending on what the light was. Yes. What else would they do? Pedestrians or drivers? Pedestrians. They may jaywalk. Yeah, at the approaching intersection, yeah. going to look right, left, and up the street. Yes. Automatically, without thinking about it. Without noting that they, that they did that. Now, what building would you automatically slow down? You? Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, so down in passing. Yes. What building? Corner building? You don't know, isn't that right? That's right. <laughs> Nobody can walk past a bakery without slowing down. <laughs> It's <laughs> for an entirety, you don't want to look at it. Then you, then you because, clean up. <laughs> because you, you're afraid you'll be tempted. You might. You might not. It's true. But that aroma around a bakery acts as if it were a thick blanket you were walking through. Your automatic would slow down. Now, do you know how to stand up? Up till now, I thought I did. <laughs> At this point, I don't know. How would you tell me how you would stand up? Describe it in words? Mm -hmm. I guess I might in this position, I might lean on my hands and get up. Let's see. I beg your pardon? Let's see if you will. Oh, no. You moved your hands back, didn't you? That's right. You didn't lean up. Well, isn't that leaning? I That's guess a backward movement of the hand. That's right. Then that's powered by pushing down, isn't it? That's right. And a leaning forward, isn't it? That's right. Why do you omit all those? 
You see, I would put down my head. Yes. I omitted it because I guess I'm not as perceptive to all the minute details that go into getting up. How did you learn to stand up? I can't recall. Do you know how you learned to stand up? I, I don't know for me, but I just remember my son learning to stand up. How? Well, um, he, you know, he had been in a, in a he'd been kneeling, uh, crawling for a long time, and he would um, gradually push on it. He would be down in his squatting position, and it seemed like he just pressed really hard, and for a long time he would kind of balance in a crouch, and gradually it seemed like he was able to move the upper part of his body and his behind you know, together to get into a vertical position, and he could just barely hold that for a minute, and he'd go over there, and he'd just kind of keep checking on different parts of his body. you have a pipe in for your son? No. interested in holding a ball. And he couldn't hold the ball in both hands and still crawl and carry it. And so he just reached. And he was so busy, I think, looking at the ball, he just kind of almost pulled himself up with the ball and he was standing upright. And then he just went flat off. You're holding the ball with one hand. What were you doing with the other? He was holding the ball with both hands. And he just, he stood himself up from his legs and he raised his hands and How do you learn to creep? I don't know exactly. He figured it out. And gradually, his, um, his swimming kind of motions and swimming motions he put together how to did, get some. How do children in general learn to creep? Um, it's really not my instruction. I think they learn. Hmm? They learn by. Um, by experimenting, by, by just using their arms and legs and, and moving them, and um, it seems like it comes together for them. How, how did you learn to stand up? I think it was uh, kind of automatic. How can anything be automatic without first being learned? The motions that that kind of came together when I stood up seemed to be an accumulation of things that I must have must have an tried. accumulation of what learnings? An accumulation of what? Of what learnings? Of things that of movements I had made before and seem to be able to do again. I seem to know at some level that I could do do this motion, make this motion, and have it fit in with other motions, I guess. How did you learn to fit them together? Well, Perhaps I tried different combinations until I found the one that that worked, and then I. What were the combinations? What were the combinations? What were the elements of the combination? keeps thinking to a, a certain desire that I had and the desire seemed to call forth certain movements. You think Bari gave a correct statement about her child learning to stand up? You think she described it accurately? The, the movement itself? 
Well, I, when I heard her describe her child's desire to hold the ball and move at the same time and have his, his holding the ball in both hands in front of him seemed to pull him up. I kind of, is that what you said? I kind of thought of the desire of his, <laughs> the desire he had for what he wanted to do kind of. Sit down, Barbara. Now, stand up the way you said your son to do. Wait a minute, you're he using couch. Well, he wasn't sitting, he was squatting. That's, that was one difference. Because he was like this. And he was leaning over, and he held the ball. And he took it in his hand like this. And he just pushed himself up. How did he learn to squat? How did he learn to squat? I don't I think it was... Um, just something that he did. I mean, in terms of how he learned. It's hard to say. Were there any chairs in the room? Yeah. But they were way too big for him. Yeah. And he was on the floor. Were the legs of the chair on the floor? Mm -hmm. Could he have taken hold of those? And pulled himself up. And pulled himself up. Yeah. Don't you think that's the way he did it? You mean at the very beginning? Mm -hmm. those times? Yeah, for a long time. He had to pull himself up. Mm -hmm. What was the next thing he had to do? Well, it would make then he would have to just let go, feel feel some kind of balance, and then experiment with letting go with one hand. Do you know what the next step is? After standing up? After pulling oneself up. The next uh, step, I would say, is uh, keeping yourself balanced, not to be, not to fall over again. Every little child has to learn how they can keep their knee, uh, knees straight. Yeah, that's a hard job, learn to keep the knees straight, because the knees bend, the child sits down. <laughs> Planet learns to keep both knees straight. It still sits down because it isn't aware of the pelvis and the hips are bending. It has to correlate the straight knees with the straight pelvis. And then what's the next step? Stay beside the chair and you hang out. You keep your knees straight and your hips straight. And then you lift one hand and alter your body balance. You have to learn how to move your hand. And your head and shoulders. And then you have to learn it with the other hand. And then with both hands. First, there's four uh, areas of support, feet and hands. And you've got to kneel out for all the hand movements, head movements, shoulder movements, and so on. And you have to learn to keep your knees straight no matter where your head is moving or where your hand is moving. You have to keep your hips straight. And then you stand there, it's very difficult to tell. How do you shift your balance from two feet to one foot? That's quite a hard job. And you have to learn to shift it to the right and then to the left. And when you move one foot forward, you alter your body balance very greatly. After learn a new body balance. 
and usually it tells us how I am moving one foot forward. That seemed to be all right. Uh, repeats that. That doesn't seem quite so good. <laughs> and then the third time, same place, move forward. Knees give way, your hips give way. Takes a long time to learn to alternate your feet. Now, show us with your hands only how you tie your shoestrings. With my shoestrings or just like this? Just, just your hands. Yeah, how do you button your jacket? Which thumb do you put through the buttonhole? Or which finger? I think I push through with my right thumb. People learn certain things. Do you know which sock you put on first? My left one. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Which shoe do you put on first? Why? I don't know that either. Yeah, first I don't went recall to, making a decision. When I first went to college, I watched my roommate. Oh, he was dressing, I was sitting at my desk making notes. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't very curious about that. After three weeks, observation, note-taking, I asked him, I wish to buy your trousers you put on first. He didn't really know. He didn't know he always put on his left side first and his right shoe first. And didn't know he always buttoned up his shirt from bottom up. We form patterns of habit and we constrict ourselves very much. Walk down the street, a fat man of died, hurries past the restaurant. A hungry man, even though it isn't time to eat, slows down. A woman beer to a jewelry window. A man beer to a sporting goods window. It was a different place. I learned something about that when my city cousin came to the farm. She didn't know how to walk over the ground. She really didn't know how. And I discovered you have difficulty walking on pavement. I can walk across a newly plowed field very easy. My poor cousin had difficulty. Yeah, David Rappaport wrote the book on memory. Excellent book. And he came from Austria. He was working at a manager clinic. <laughs> I watched him eating. And why do you hold your fork? How do they hold a fork in your pen? Oh, left hand. American's on the right hand. 
Ask Dave how long it be before he could learn to eat like an American. One morning I had a breakfast in a hotel in Chicago. I was lecturing there on hypnosis. A Chicago doctor joined me at the at breakfast. I noticed a look of pain on his face when I broke my slice of toast in half and buttered one half and ate it. I picked up the other and he said, well, haven't you ever learned table manners? I want to know what that meant. And he explained to me very carefully, cut your slice of toast into quarters. You butter each quarter separately. Eat. You butter a quarter, eat it, and then you butter another quarter and eat it. Well, the next morning I butter the whole slice. And he really suffered. I broke it into thirds. He really suffered. We all learn certain routine, limited, constricted ways of doing things. I know of only one person who learned to sit up, stand up, and walk. I hope in between steps. And my youngest granddaughter earned a crate using only her right hand and her right leg. It just carried the other along as baggage. Yeah, she could creep everywhere using only her right hand and right leg. And then again using both legs and both hands. We all have our own peculiar ways of doing things. Now, consciously you use the end result of your learnings. You learn to talk baby dog. First you learn to make crying noises. And you learn to make crying noise and told your mother, I'm cold, I'm wet, I'm hungry, I don't feel well, I want to be cuddled. You make different cries. Then you learn to make, you recognize that people made noises and you began imitating that. If I your reasons, Say to her, you say, Deep Wawa. And your parents knew you meant a drink of water. It took you a long time to realize that Deep Wawa was really a drink of water. And how did you learn to uh, say words? A child learning to read. Sounds out, the sound. Bother, bother. And now you talk all day long without everyone thinking about the sound, without paying attention to how many syllables are the word. It took you a long time to learn verbs, nouns, Adjectives, adverb. I see it. To you learn to learn to say I saw it. I see it. I see it. Yeah, same way in writing. You know how you learn to write. Can you imitate that? Oh, I learned. 
my memory goes back to picturing myself in school. Oh, all right. And and in the front of the class, there'd be these big charts with the letters and arrows on them, and which line to draw. And it'd be sitting there with a big piece of paper yes. and a thick pencil, <laughs> practicing. How do you practice drawing your first straight line? I guess I made a, some kind of a mark on a paper, and I, and I must have he had the image in my mind of what I wanted it to look like, that I wanted it to look straight and not hear bumps and wiggles. And I tried what, were you, what were you doing with your feet at the time? What were you doing with your shoulders at the time? With your head? I think my, I picture my body being cocked in concentration. And grimacy. And what? And grimacy. Both children learning to write and they move their feet and their hands and their head and they grimace, screw up their paces. Once you've learned to write, you don't do that. Don't you recall your teacher saying, write with only your arm, with only your hand? Do you? I don't. Well, I'm trying to get across to you is that you know so many things that you don't know you know. Uh, a newly born baby, uh, even baby a month old, doesn't know how to shed tears. He knows how to cry and shed tears. And when a baby eats Salad food, what does it secrete saliva? Are you asking me a question? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I missed it. A baby's salad food, when does it secrete saliva? I don't know. Mother? Do a lot, don't they? First step in learning to secrete saliva is drooling. Without relationship to eating. After a while, they learn to secrete saliva in relationship to eating. What else do they learn about saliva? You secrete a different saliva for a pet, a different saliva for a protein, a different saliva for carbohydrates. It's the first time you do that, isn't it? How did you learn to do that? Your body learned. Your body learns a lot of things. And you were fed your first solid food and that way you pass through your stomach without being digested. Your body swallowed your first solid food without secreting saliva. After a while you learn to secrete saliva 
after you'd fallen. You had a hard to have learned to secret well the food was in your mouth. And then you had to learn her saliva and the esophageal fluid and the food at the upper end of the stomach, middle of the stomach, lower end of the stomach, upper end of the small intestine, and so on. It's like learning A, B, C, the alphabet. You have to secrete saliva in a certain order and all the digestive juices. The children learn to digest food differently. I have a six-year-old son who would digest beans and practically every other thing except peas. It took him over six years to learn how to digest peas. We learn to digest foods at different rates, according to kind of, our, in our function now, we just use the end results of a vast and long process of learning. And you say, a hand put you in a trance. Is that right? You said, Oh, Hanlon put you in a trance. Um, well, he was discussing the class, and he was leading the, the group. That All right. How do you go into a trance? Well, um, I didn't know. I mean, consciously, I didn't know. Um, you know, until I until I got there, what was that? I was actually fighting or arguing. Not, you know, but I'm not going to do this because you guys are doing something. Don't hide in that corner. Get over it. Okay. Yeah. How do you think I would put you in a trance? How do I think you would put me in a trance? I don't know. Oops, for the corner of that picture there. Put your hands on your thigh and feet on the floor. Just look toward that one corner. Don't move. Don't talk. I'm going to remind you of the time you first learned to write the letters of the alphabet. It seemed to be a terribly difficult job. All those different letters, different forms, and different shapes. All oh, those letters that are printed letters, or written letters, or capital letters, small letters. And so gradually you learn to form a visual mental image, which you locate somewhere in your brain. And you didn't know you were locating it in your brain. And you didn't know you were locating it there permanently. Now, I've been talking to you. You change your rate of respiration. Your heart rate is altered. Your blood pressure is altered. Your muscle tones have changed. Your motor reflexes have changed. And when next I say the word now, you'll close your eyes now. And you're feeling very self-conscious. And gradually you feel more and more comfortable. And the more comfortable you feel, the deeper into the trance you go. You can go as deeply in the trance as you wish. You go 
so deeply in the trance, they'll seem to you as if you're a bodiless mind. Floating in time, floating in space, sensing only my voice, and my voice can change into different voices, voices of your parents, your siblings, your neighbors, your schoolmates, your playmates, and memories will come to your mind that you forgot a long time ago. find yourself sitting in a schoolroom looking at a lesson or looking at a schoolmate or you may find yourself at home eating Thanksgiving dinner looking at the Christmas tree, looking at a puppy, or someone of long ago. And what I'm emphasizing here is a casual conversation. It may seem pointless, uninformative, not well organized, can create a climate in which a trance can be induced. You can close your eyes now. You can close your eyes now. And go very deeply into the trance. Sensing my voice, it may change into the voice of siblings, neighbors, parents, schoolmates, playmates, whatever sounds belong to your childhood. Have you enjoy being in a trance? Enjoy members. When she changed that, her right hand was immobile. Did you notice it? Yeah, I saw it in my, in that field. It did not make the usual uh, adjusted movements. Bending over and 
continue that tape. He left her right hand where it was. Just bent over. Yeah, I wouldn't bend over. I'm very likely to do that. Yeah. Do you know if you're in a trance? that I was comfortable where I was and I heard the tape go off and I made an active decision to open my eyes and turn the tape over rather than stay. Did you know you were in a trance? I don't know what a trance is. Do you think you're in a trance now? Um, I'm willing to entertain the possibility. And I don't move. Just sit there and wait. Ordinarily, we nod the head this way. Well, we mean yes. We we'll shake our head from side to side. We we'll mean no. I'm going to ask you a question, which can be answered by either a nod of the head or a shake of the head. But you wait and wait until your head does the moving. You don't do it. You wait for your head. Are you in a trance? regular movement of her head and said, I don't know. Now she's beginning to nod her head, yes. And the unconscious movement of the head nodding yes is Characterized by perseveration. You know you're still in trance. As a conscious nodding your head. Well, you can see what your head does. Satisfied with that? Yeah, she's obviously in a trance. A loss of mobility. The important thing in inducing a trance is to be utterly confident that a person can go into a trance. Because everybody can go. And if you're utterly competent, are fully expected, confidence, expectation are the most powerful forces. I'll give you an illustration of, of the meaningfulness of.
Yes, you wondered. And then you drew your own conclusion. Uh -huh. You nod your head as well as saying, uh -huh. You don't know it. You apparently are not going to let yourself know it. Is that? Know what? That you can go into a trance. I never experienced it, so I can't tell. I expect I can. You have an unrecognized objection to knowing that you can go into a trance. If it's unrecognized, then it's possible I do have it. Are you getting, noticing that nodding the head she does? I began nodding my head. She altered her blink reflex. I'll be aware of that. As an occupational hazard working at the airport, if there's a tendency toward epilepsy, the rotating propellers and the, the sheen, the shininess of the propellers and rotating can cause an epileptic seizure. Go. In your response, you make so many responses to the rotation of power, you only get a, a tragic glimpse. And that requires an excessive amount of activity in the brain. It's overcharges that area of your brain. You have an epileptic seizure. Some lay hypnotist brought out whirling discs with colors. They could alternate the speed of the, you know, change the speed of the rotating discs, and they cause epileptic seizures sometimes in their subjects. Now, how many of you are aware of the fact you're not hearing street sounds? Now you hear them. You had stopped hearing them. And now you're going very acutely aware of sounds. For a while. I trained the advanced marksmanship team of the 
had been a rifle team of the United States Army for the international shoot on year. Now, I don't know anything about a rifle. I know which is the stock end of a rifle and which is the muzzle end. I coach the team what, uh, getting interested in hypnosis as a training measure. And I got invited down to Fort Bennington to train the team. How do you think I would train a team for marksmanship for an international shoot? I haven't told you that before, have I? No. Oh, uh, I knew that you remember the team knew their rifles thoroughly. Also knew what they didn't know was their own physical behavior. Uh, Use uh, hypnotic trance to make them acutely aware of all of their body. And I'll describe how a rifle team who resigned from the army described how he won the National High Power Rifle. Uh, championship in the United States and worked for Winchester Rifle Company for a couple of years, going around the country giving exhibition demonstrations of shooting. Lieutenant Edwin, his nickname was Piggy. Piggy visited us. I said, where well, won the national championship was this. First, I let the sole of my feet fit on the ground. And then I saw that my ankles were very comfortable. I cast my legs became comfortable. My knees became comfortable. My body became comfortable. Left hand holding the rifle barrel was, was comfortable. I felt the stock against my shoulder feeling very comfortable. Then I carefully put my cheek against the stock and waving a gun sight up and down across the target. And when everything had perfect comfort, and my teeth came together just exactly right. I squeezed the trigger. The additional thing is that in a rifle marksmanship contest, each contestant shoots 40 rounds. Getting the first bullseye is not very difficult or getting the second. And you know, you've got nine when you get the tenth. You've got nineteen when you get the twentieth. You've got twenty-nine when you get the thirtieth. You've got thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty, thirty-nine, Will you make it to the last fortieth time? So what I taught them was every time they squeeze the trigger to forget that they squeeze the trigger. And they happy told, you've shot your forty round, they think it was this. Getting ready for the second shot.
Reverend Roger Bailey, sir. From where? San Diego. San Diego. What knowledge do you have of hypnosis? Uh, well, I've read a couple of your books and uh, studied with uh, Harold Greenwald at uh, USIU, and then uh, I've been studying on my own during those three patients in my private practice. And do you know Joe Bar Barber? Hmm? Do you know Joe Barber? No, I don't. Greenwald? Yeah, Greenwald. Who else? Oh, dear. Uh, Harold Greenwald. Uh, a fellow named uh, Dr. Kroger out of Los Angeles. I went to two workshops that he presented. Have you ever been in a trance? Yes. Who put you in? Uh, a fellow named Paul... Two people actually, a uh, physician in Chula Vista, and then Paul uh, Carter, uh, Senator. Paul Carter. Mm -hmm. What method did he use? Is, what method does Paul use? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's almost like a metaphor method. He just talks, and then I relax and change my breathing and out I go. Hold your head out like this. As far away from you as you can. Look at your thumb there. And just watch your thumb moving slowly toward your face. Very slowly. Closer it gets to your face. The more and more you'll go into a trance. And by the time your thumb reaches your face, your eyes will close. And you feel very comfortable. And you'll go deeper and deeper into a trance. Because even sooner, Thumb touch your face. You'll discover something. And the thing you're discovering is that you're very comfortable. Going deeper and deeper in trance. Now that's a method of people can buy for the induction of auto hypnotic trances. Did I mention the mirror method? No. I can do it. Many years ago, in the 1950s, I was 
giving a lecture on hypnosis, a seminar. And one of the doctors attending the seminar, six feet six, big burly man, all muscle and bone. He came up to me and said, I'm Bulldog Drummond. And nobody, just nobody in the whole wide world can put me in a trance. Nobody can hypnotize myself, can hypnotize me. You and the others can try all you want to, it won't work. But I would like to be hypnotized. Is are you sure you would like to be? He said, most certainly. Now, how can I? Well, I'm bulldog. I hang on. I don't let anybody put anything over on me. I said, well, tonight, when you're ready to go to bed, sit down in front of the mirror and look in the mirror at the man that's going to put you in a deep hypnotic trance. I wake him about seven o'clock the next morning. He remained in trance all night long. He awakened. He said, if I had known I was going to go into a trance, I would have got into a more comfortable position. Mm-hmm. Recently I had a, a former 1950 patient called me up who said, I've been employing a couple hours a day for the past year to reduce auto-hypnosis. I've got a book of instructions here. I've been following, I've done everything the book said. I haven't gone into a trend. It's a, it's a book that Frank Capri wrote on auto-hypnosis. She said, yes, I said, that book is trash. All books on auto-hypnosis are trash. If you want to go into an auto-hypnotic trance, you should have called me a year ago, and I would have told you how. Oh, so, Joan, today, I want you to sit down in front of your dresser and look at yourself in the mirror. Now first, set your alarm clock for an alarm to sound in 20 minutes. She says her alarm clock. She started looking at herself, and the alarm went off. And as she heard it later, I thought I had misset the alarm because I just started looking at myself. So this time, I made sure I said it correctly. I started looking at myself, and the alarm went off again, and the clock showed that 20 minutes had passed by. Too many people say, now relax, relax yourself, relax your ankles, your knees, your muscles, your thighs, muscles, your body. All you're doing then is you're consciously telling yourself, what to do consciously. You look in the mirror and let your unconscious mind take over. Just blank your mind. When Joan looks in the mirror, she doesn't know what she's going to see there. Her mind was wide open. Bulldog Drummond sat down and looked at the at himself Keep in mind, when you look in your mirror, sit down and look in your mirror, bedtime, you'll see the man who's going to hypnotize you. That really didn't make any sense to him. 
Mind-wide of wheel watering. And he doubled deep breaths. Are you still trying to say? No, I, I don't really think so. Hmm? I don't think so. Yeah. But I'm very much more relaxed. You what? I'm much more relaxed than when I came here. You're sure you're not in trance? <laughs> With you, Dr. Erickson, no, I'm not sure. <laughs> Dr. Erickson, could you say something about what a trance state is? Mm-hmm. Could you say something about what a trance state is? Yeah. A conscious state of awareness includes your environment. Translate, you're paying attention to the things that are important. To the things that are important. That are relevant, that are important. In Betty's demonstration of hypnosis, she was able to describe the changes in the very sensory field acid levels, areas. And when she's in the trance, I asked her to see the McTeers. Her professor of psychology was Francis McTeer. From Florida. Uh, they've now moved from Detroit to Florida. And, and she saw Francis and his wife. He wasn't seeing anything else, just some tears. And she was making no allowance, paying any heed to anything else. And apparently they told her they moved to Florida. Now she doesn't like to hallucinate. I caught her unawares. <laughs> he has no hard feelings about that. He's amused. And do you know how if you remember she's in a trance? Do you remember how she went into a trance? Do you, can you speculate on how she was able to remember as you went into a trance? How she was able or how I was able to? How she was able she to was remember. Able. Ordinarily, when she goes into a trance, <coughs> she develops a total amnesia for her, doesn't know anything about it. She goes, here she is in conscious state, conscious awareness. She goes into a trance, and here's the trance that when she awakens, she's back here. Goes from the waking awareness to trance awareness. And when she awakes, she's back where she left off at the conscious awareness. It is as if her conscious awareness had not been interrupted at all. But she hung on to the pay that you two were present. Yeah, I think so. And while I went in the house, there, she said, Were the Germans satisfied?
has a wonderful He didn't include in her awareness the presence of the others. Oh, yes. I wonder why you're here. to do more than see me. I listen to you. I observe. Yeah. I listen to you. Observe. Try to observe what you're doing. How? And what will I do for you? What will what do for me? Observe and see how I do think. What will it do for me? Mm -hmm. I assume a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I assume a number of things. Of what? I learn a number of things. You and Mark Spitz. You know the name, do you not? Mark Spitz, yes. This one, Mark? Mm -hmm. You and for a whole year and you won't learn a thing about swimming. That's why I don't go to see Mark Spitz. To learn to swim, you have to get into the water. That's right. Why are you staying out of the water? You're avoiding all now and you, your hypnotic responses. Why? And your name is Roger? Yes, sir. How much do you know about hypnosis? Uh, well, it, it depends on the situation, how much I can bring in the, into memory. Sometimes I think I know a lot. Times like this, I don't think I know anything. Rory, mm -hmm. tell them something about your childhood that you had long ago forgotten. What memories came to you in the trance What memory came to me? Um, I just envisioned a Christmas tree. Hmm? I envisioned a Christmas tree in the basement of my of the house that my parents lived in. How long was it you thought about that Christmas? Um, yeah, I don't know. A long time. And when you're in envisioning that tree, where were you? On the stairs, looking at it. On the stairs. Mm -hmm. Where you were dressed. That's where I was. Well, what were you wearing at the time? Um, pink pajamas. Hmm? Some pink pajamas. How old were you? Um, the number eight comes to mind, but I don't, I don't know if that's right or not. You wore pink pajamas when you were eight years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Is that? I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. Look, three remote memories came to your mind. 
I remembered how when uh, I was younger, I shared a bedroom with my younger brother, and that rather regularly he would climb into bed with me sometime during the night, and we'd sleep together, and that felt real good. I remember how good it felt to have that. And how old were you then? I was just thinking about that when you asked her. I was thinking around 12 or 13. And were you recalling a memory? Where were you? What I pictured was the bedroom with my brother and I in bed. And did you feel the bed? No, I felt him more than felt I felt him. the bed. Yeah. And what did you do? Um, I had a couple of memories. One was um, having a big family dinner in the living room, the three-room apartment that I grew up in with my parents. And that was also the, um, my, that was where I slept. I slept on the couch. And at night, the cars would go by and I would watch the patterns as the light would go across the wall disappear until another car would come and it would light up. And were you seeing that light pattern? Uh-huh. How old were you at the time? I was about eight. How did it feel? I have some sadness about it. Hmm? I have some sadness about it. I just had that kind of memory of um, being all alone in the room. Yeah. It demonstrates how easily you can get regression. You know, you start. Just watch Roger. A little corner of that up there. Don't move, don't talk. I'm going to remind you what time we're going to school and first learning to write the letters of the alphabet. All those different letters, different shapes and forms. So many letters, and so many different kinds of letters. Printed letters, written letters, capital letters, small letters. And you cross the I and dot the T, and where you put the circle on the end of that short straight line for a B, for a D, for a P. Now, which side of the circle do you put that little tail for a Q? And do you cross a T at the very top? a little bit down. It's about the right, isn't it? Are you a big boy? Uh-huh. Do you ever climb a tree? How old are you? You're quite a big boy. 
Do you have a dog? Or a cat? Or a bird? I once had a pet dub. I like my dub very much. And what is your name? Do you know my name? Somewhere. Somewhere. Uh -huh. Who am I? right now. Two places. What is that? Two places. I'm standing in a yard looking at a tree. And yet I'm here. There's your double orientation. I brought about that double orientation by asking all the wrong questions. I could have followed along on just questions relating to the fifth year of life. I'd been all right. When I As soon as he knew my name, I then forced him into another orientation. You're still oriented to the age of five, and still oriented to me. But it took him a long time to get oriented to me. It was quite a process, a mental process he went through to get into two different places. Our aggression isn't so difficult to achieve, but you have to watch your questions and see to it whatever you say is in keeping with the regression that you elicit. Let's go play somewhere. Will that be all right? What shall we play with? I like throwing stones. I throw my cars. Oh, yeah. Clothes. Clothes. I like to throw stones see if I hit a tree. Sometimes I try to throw some over a tree. Can you throw a stone over a tree? You're too hard? Too high. Too high. Wake up remember everything. Yeah. I have to move. Maybe you can't. 
whatever you can. And I've seen a demonstration of doubt as effectiveness. I should be videotaping this. I won't remember all this. Well, okay. Maybe I will. Maybe I will remember all this. And did I tell you about the nurse at Boston State Hospital?